Boy, uh, how you doing on this Friday, sir? Hello, Ryan. I'm doing spectacular, yeah, especially you know now what? that I get to see your face. I know. It's, it's nothing but smiles when we get time to see each other. Yeah. And I got credit. Like we've evolved to the point where I'm saying this landing page, this this little screen right here of our charming, beautiful faces is is just spectacular. Yep. Been told I have a face for radio. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm glad. I'm glad that I get to show it here. Yeah, I, I'm. Uh, I'm in the same bucket. I have those conversations <laughs> often. I use this microphone to cover for uh <laughs> for the face. Um, it looks. I'm. I'm excited. You know, we were talking about. Hey, we, we want to do on our next LinkedIn Live. We were talking about. Hey, you know, this use the Olympics as a as as a topic and and what challenges they they've encountered and and obviously it's a a very large event right mm -hmm. i think probably the largest event held every four years um and we have some some good history and some i think places where there's lessons learned and i think there's some good patterns that we'll find uh in this conversation um i don't know are you ready to get started i am but before that really like if you were to compete in any olympic sport what do you think it would be so as a as a youngster, I did do track. Uh, oh. Did I perform well? No, I did not. I I got beat very very difficult. <laughs> very, yeah. I, I got beat heavily. Um, but there was something about short sprints, right? So the 100, 200, 400. Um, there was something that in my youth, I I did train. Yeah, many many years. Uh, I was instructed to use track and field to help try to perform my speed when I played football and pop Warner. There you go. So I ran as a very young, yeah. And I would say if I, I took the next evolution in my, my youth and my age and what sport I then became more passionate about, I would probably go after boxing. Yeah, that was my thing. That's what I did when I was a younger person. And uh, yeah, I don't think I would, be competitive at the olympic level but you know it's nice to think about every once in a while plus uh, boxing is one of my favorite things to watch at the olympic level because uh, at the professional level it's kind of boring at times um but yeah anyway let's uh yeah. let's go on to uh cyber security in the olympics yeah you know what i'm thinking this almost needs to become uh something as much focal point as the the athletes themselves um but let's get into it, right? There's obviously the news news radius is out there. Everybody's talking about it because it's it's we're going into trials. Everything is kind of already manifesting. So um, obviously it becomes a, a topic for everybody to discuss. What we don't see here is that we don't see the news happening as I, would I, my opinion, this is definitely, definitely opinion, <laughs> that the news doesn't start populating this information out three years ago when Paris has started working on this four years ago when they were selected in essence, all the years that they're putting into building this up. And I think we'll see some of this in the conversations with what we see as, as lessons learned or what we saw from previous Olympics. I don't know if you have the same opinion or if you disagree or if it's just like, Hey, it's always good to have it in, in front of us at the time. Yeah. Look, I think, I think we'll see more news about this if something bad happens. Um, but yeah, um, there's historically speaking, it's very likely. So as we go over what we have, I, I kind of seeded this as we talked about it on my LinkedIn post, I was kind of starting to build out the chain of, um, going back from 2008, but we'll go from 2008 to 2020 and kind of just do a, a, a review of what took place, what it looked like on what scale and have a little bit of discussion on each one of them, uh, and see where we go from there. I think that. We, we might be littered with our own opinions about hindsight and what we could have done better. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Uh, so if we go over, you know, when I was doing some of this, uh, you know, looking up and, and remembering of the past, right? 2008 is so long ago. I mean, come on. It's, I could barely remember last year, but uh, 2008. I was graduating I college. <laughs> how long ago that was <laughs> I, yeah. I don't even want to recall what i was doing in 2008 um <laughs> but we did end up you know finding out that shady rat uh was was prevalent right um and what what was going on was um it was more or less i think working towards 
data extraction, right? Um, they, Shady Rat was operating from 2006 to 2011. That's a long time for our, for a pretty pretty solid operation. And uh, from what I recall, it was about 70 organizations, and it kind of more or less went across about 14 countries, uh, targeting government and defense contractors. You know, the the motivation of that organization and of that operation, I believe, if I recall correctly, was around cyber espionage. Uh, so they're looking at trying to get IP, uh, secrets, email archives, any kind of any kind of sensitive information they can get their hands on. Um, I don't think they they kind of restricted much of what they were looking to to acquire. Right. They were, I think, kind of almost like spray and pray, get anything they can uh get out of whatever environment they were compromising yeah i wonder how much of it like was kind of mitigated with like the firewall of china (laughs) right like like it's got to be pretty hard to like go in in a meaningful capacity unless you're another nation state to really have a lot of success but they did have success um and i think yeah, with any sort of Olympics, there's a ton of very important people that tend to go there and view at least some of the events. So the opportunity to plant something such as a, you know, or cloning a device or like malware that can then get extract information from that individual for months or years to come is very compelling because you kind of have everybody all at once in the same place that you might want to go after. Yeah, that and how many... How many, I mean, you have how many governments involved? You have how many, you know, as you're describing, VIPs. And and that's not even just the attendees, like the, the organizations that are contributing, funding, and, and you know, sponsoring, like the amount yep. of sponsors for the Olympics as well. Let's move on to London. Oh, uh, you remember them in order. That's, uh, you do better than I. I need, I need visual cues for some of these things. I have the slides <laughs> on my other screen, so don't give me that much credit. <laughs> You're not supposed to leak that out, man. We're supposed to keep it, <laughs> keep it like we're we're really well rehearsed here. Um, London was pretty interesting. That's when they started really seeing more of a DDoS situation, right? Um, and I, th- I think you and I have had conversations where, even under a DDoS, is a DDoS really just the sole purpose, or was it a distraction technique? Um, I think they logged about 212 million cyber incidents during the London Games. And I, I would say not just the games. I think there was some some pre-game and, and post. But this is when they started tracking the viewership. And if you can think about the scale of what you have to do as a, an organization to support this, they had uh, 38.3 billion page views on the Olympic site. Yeah, I think this is the first Olympics where probably like everybody had a mobile phone in their pocket with an internet connection that went to that went to the Olympics, right? So 2008, like, well, it was in China and the iPhone was pretty much brand new. 2012, everybody, it was a completely different scenario. And I think 2012 was also the time frame where like botnets in particular were pretty popular in terms of attack methods. And so we saw a ton of DDoS um, and we saw a ton of just, hey, look, can we take down the Olympics type of stuff, which you know, a lot of hackers sometimes do things just for the props from other hackers, and there's no bigger stage in the world than the Olympics. Yeah, I would I would agree a lot. There's also the the hacktivism, right? Kind of the the D, DDoS is kind of the the sit in of of the digital age, right? Um, yeah. A lot of lessons that were learned, and I think it was how much focal point they or how much focus they put on on the infrastructure to operate it. And as you said, right, like iPhone digital, like it was kind of the first soiree. And I think, I think they could put a pretty good victory on, on the defensive measures that they had. Um, if we look at Rio though, Rio had a little bit of, di- we, we had some things happen between London and Rio um, where they did fancy bear didn't make a, an appearance. And um, you and I know as well, Fishing, fishing is so successful um, that they were able to capitalize on this, and they motivated by more or less, I guess, retaliation for some of the situations in which their their nation state was was being held accountable accountable for, uh, in lack of participation. Um, this had a growth though, 
where they had logged 212 million events at London. Rio logged around 500 million. That's yeah, I insane. think it's, I think, it, you know, when we look at countries that have like the most sophisticated cybersecurity controls, you know, we think about the United States, we think about Russia, China, like Israel, we think about the UK also has a very mature cyber program, inter- comparatively speaking to all the other countries, Rio, uh, Brazil, not so much, right? Like it's, uh, you know, the, I would say, you know, they're kind of far behind or traditionally from a lot of other places. Uh, and, and so I think that's why we, we saw a much broader set of attacks in general. And also just from 2012, 2016, hackers got better, right? A lot of the, a lot of the phishing attacks, for example, between 2012, 2016 started becoming highly automated. Yeah. I mean, and I think there was actually even reference that, um, not just the automation, they got much better with spear phishing and they also had some insight with some password spraying techniques. Um, so that. And you and I obviously being hyper, like, well, we could easily mitigate that going forward. Um, the, the bane of our existence is, uh, is, is the password itself. Um, but I yeah. think there was that, that definite leap and bound in that evolution, right? As, as you're saying, automation got better. Um, and obviously this was a nation state. Uh, so they had all the financing and support that one would ever need to go and, and execute. Uh, And there was even note or reports of uh, physical oriented attacks from hotel Wi-Fi's and things like that. So now we have to start considering like the Olympic villages and athletes, hotel rooms and those networks. Yeah, I was looking like what happened in 2016 from a credential stuffing perspective that was really interesting. And the one event that I found was in May 2016, right before the Olympics those 117 million passwords that were stolen from LinkedIn a couple of years prior to that just became available for everybody to download on the internet. (laughs) And so I'm sure that had something to do Mm -hmm. with the password spraying efforts of of the hackers, because, you know, if you can afford a ticket to go to the Olympics, you know, you you probably have a LinkedIn account. Yeah. The, the odds are you have a LinkedIn account and, um, Back then, probably the same practice being deployed, which is your LinkedIn password was the same as your bank password was the same <laughs> as. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All and, right, you know, that's why we're so glad that LinkedIn, you know, doesn't support passwords anymore. Oh, wait, just kidding. Yes, they do. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll move on. Um, we're doing pretty good. 2018, though. 2018 was pretty big. Um I will definitely cite some something else to follow up on if anybody wants the the more in depth story of what took place in 2018. If you do not remember, uh, but this is a continuation. There was an APT involved. There was a nation state. I am I am obviously avoiding saying specific names, just where you can all put it together. Um, the it was Russia. <laughs> <laughs> Really, it was Russia. I think this is when they had like a lot of doping scandal type stuff, especially within the Russian teams. And uh, Russia was kind of upset. Is that correct? Was that this one? That was this is retaliation. So, this retaliation started after London. Okay. So, yeah. this was so the, the first iteration with the previous with Fancy Bear was kind of the start of this arc of retaliation and picking um, specific targets. This was malicious as hell, though. This was, fo- I I don't want to. I'm going to steal someone's language. I, well, actually, I'm not going to steal it. Our government, our own <laughs> government, basically called Russia whiny little babies and acting in a tantrum in response to their being banished or or being banned from the games due to the the doping scandals that that were found. But in doing so, this shows nation states who have the the financing have the power who make an investment and I don't want to promote, but when you look at the, if you research what Olympic destroyer was and you look at all the threat Intel and all the reverse engineers and everything that they did with Olympic destroyer, it was actually a piece of art. Like it was pretty sophisticated in the things that they did. The amount of clues that they left on purpose to keep saying, all right, well, attribution is North Korea. No attribution is China. 
no attribution is North Korea. No attribution. The, the amount of places that they left specific clues. No, it was almost like they knew the researchers who were going to pick up this malware. Like they were sending messages specifically to individuals. Yeah, like on, the like the Russian malware that was used had like Chinese comments in it. Like when you decompile the source code, because they were trying to like hide the fact that it was Russia, which is and this is when Mimi Cats was like really really popular and just setting the world on fire with regards to like um, uh, a ransomware and, and and all that type of stuff. And this also goes back to understanding how did you initially get the malware, right? In essence, we know like if you get somebody to click a link, but in essence, it had to get in to the environment somehow. And this was like, I'm going to go with it. It started at phishing. It started at getting somebody to click that link, getting malware deployed and it having its password ceiling. Um, and it also had some intelligence where there was some hard coded credentials. So that meant there was a, a little bit of reconnaissance already in place where they had obtained credentials, which if it's hard coded, it was a password. So they were able to extract that password from, from some other technique embed that into the the malware because this was a whack-a-mole like I, if you i really would recommend go listen to darknet diaries episode 77 to hear <laughs> the story in much more detail than this um but it was whack-a-mole anytime a domain controller came up it, it was infected it basically everything came and got attacked as they came back online in their recovery efforts and i think this was uh a very big learning experience for an Olympic hosting country on being one of the most connected of Olympics, right? So we talked about that arc in London, starting to be the iPhone and the technology evolution and connected. You know, the this was probably the most, obviously, iterative connected devices. They had two data centers and they had an IT staff of about 150 people. And this thing almost disappeared at opening center ceremony like th this was so precisionally executed it was insane and basically using like a 10 year old version of windows server i think so <laughs> that, uh... there is that and uh, once again the foundation was on passwords right yeah. so it started at spear phishing um we, we can think about things that we could do moving forward tokyo though the olympics um... that nobody watched <laughs> yeah, it was... <laughs> I remember, I remember watching some of it and like there was, this was, you know, during the height of the pandemic and stuff and like nobody was in the audience. It was just so weird to see. It was sad because I think Tokyo is such a great spot for an Olympics event that, uh, but yeah, the, regardless, there was plenty to talk about on the cybersecurity side. Well, I mean, if you think about it, what did we have happen? We had less, less physical presence, which meant we transitioned to a much greater digital presence. Which, I mean, when we, we, we sit here and we talk about it as, uh, you know, security individuals that, hey, with that pandemic, what did that do? That that created um, that created a huge threat landscape that was not prepared for, right? With all these new systems being exposed and being connected to, um, that just cr increased the attack service for every organization. I believe for Tokyo, though, it kind of showed a little bit that it was more sit-in oriented because they had a high level of DDoS, um, not so much under the nefarious. Uh, there wasn't much evidence of, say, the nation states finding success. At least there wasn't anything that was reported. Um, and the amount of preparation that they put in around pen testing and, and their SOC uh, was really, really... Um, I think more advanced than the others. The obviously, pro, you know, proactive measures is oh, we're always going to advocate the 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 robust identity management um, and following standard practices, least privilege. In essence, you could talk about how you know pass keys like for 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 future Olympics, pass keys would have a huge benefit, in my opinion. Yeah, this was I think around the time that an article also came out that like. Or maybe after afterwards, like the that the Japan cybersecurity minister had never used the computer. <laughs> it's that, hey, that's a good way to be secured, right? It's almost yeah. like, hey, I can't be fished if I don't read my email. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I guess you know, 
given that the fact that you know there wasn't a a uh, a, a fancy bear type of situation like is is kudos to the folks in Tokyo who really made this secure and and we know some of the people over at uh, NTT ourselves uh, through working with the Fido Alliance and they're all a bunch of really smart people and uh, really good at securing their networks. So it was really good to see that th they were very proactive in, in protecting the Olympics from cyber attacks. Yeah, the, the one thing as we go over this topic, I want to put my hat off to every one of the CISOs, the assigned CISOs for every one of these hosting countries, because I, I, the level of stress for buildup until the day of and operating through the games that has got to be one of the most stressful situations to be living through. Predictions, though. I think we've got some good, fun predictions. And yes, of course, Simone Biles is going to win gold. That's just how that goes. I don't I don't think we'll have any uh, any argument from any, uh, any of us U.S.-oriented individuals here. <laughs> yeah, man. Um, I think you and I are both uh, pretty much in support that we're going to see the, the uptick in AI oriented uh we could say gen ai the level of i think spear fishing is going to be probably a little bit more astronomical with paris um the the deep fake side and i would even say that maybe maybe some of the attendees uh will probably get some phone calls from their service providers that are not their service providers right um i think that would be a great opportunity to capitalize on if i was going to be nefarious yeah, I think um, I think you know we live in a world now where, you know, we we used to differentiate between phishing attacks and spear phishing attacks, and now they're all just spear phishing attacks due to the AI, right? So, if you were at the Olympics four years ago, you know, the chances are the hackers were sending phishing campaigns or doing phishing campaigns in a single language. Right now, like with AI tools, all those phishing campaigns can be translated into the language of the person who's receiving it with a lot more context and accuracy and everything else. So I think phishing attacks will be much more successful this time around as a result. Um, and you're right, like people will be receiving messages from their cell phone carrier and they will be extremely compelling, maybe even phone calls uh, from them that, you know, sound exactly the correct um in in every way shape and form so i think we'll just see a, see a different level of sophistication that's targeting these organizations that these individuals attending yeah the um i, I think they're I, i'm gonna go with probably a lot more a lot more um scam oriented with the audience being that you know what the last uh really the last olympics wasn't attended as as we were talking about it was you know we're kind of really coming out of pandemic life people are getting back into the being back in person and enjoying all the events and i think that will will have a pretty high contribution to to some of the maybe individuals that fall under scam um so i know I wish we could just tell everybody to go to a pass key, but that's not going to happen in, in a short period of time for, for, for Paris. <laughs> I would, I would, um, there is, um, if you do start seeing strange behavior with your emails for anybody who is a fan and participating, change your passwords. Don't use the same passwords. Use a password manager. And if it happens to be that there's any service that does support a pass key, please enroll a pass key. It will, you'll, you'll have a little bit of, uh, more more soft sleeping evenings where you know you're not going to have a, a scam oriented uh, attack against you. Um, make sure make sure you patch your your stuff too. If you're running around with a, a laptop, if you're running around with your your phone, make sure your your security updates are in place. Um, I know this isn't necessarily an enterprise or corporate kind of scenario, but it's more of an individual oriented um, recommendation. Yeah, hey, I was before this. I downloaded the uh, Olympic, the Paris Olympics app, right? And uh, shocker, it is password based, but at least they require at least ten characters with a, with a lowercase and uppercase, a special character, and a number. Hey, <laughs> that's so. That's something, I guess. Uh, um, and you know, I, I I only got to that screen after I was trying to figure out like what the actual mascot is. I have no idea what this thing is. 
that's a conversation for another that, day. That, that's a conversation of a marketing and or uh, what, what message are we trying to convey with the mascot and or logo? <laughs> um, I believe we actually even put together a high level starter pack. Um, I was already kind of alluding to some of these things. Um, you kind of crushed my hopes and dream boy. I did not download the Olympic app. Uh, not yet, but it didn't sound like MFA was even an option. No, nope, not at all. Paris, Paris in the Olympics, please, <laughs> please roll out an update before the live of the games. Um, you got, you got a small window to make a change. Yeah. Um, you know, usually, usually we like to always recommend to stay safe on public Wi-Fi. Um, obviously, there's some things out there like pineapples. Um, there's even a possibility like we, we can just be cognizant of where you are. Um, public Wi-Fi is pretty, pretty decent these days, but there still can be suspicious components. And I would say, you know what, if I had wanted to catch a, a high traffic area, I would probably inject myself um maybe have something to capture some information through a public wi-fi that it would be a, a ripe for opportunity and if we we know anything about non-nation state actors they are opportunistic uh they will try to take advantage of of cheap cheap investments to to get a return yeah the one thing to be you know especially cautious of here is um a lot of people going to the Olympics are staying in either hotels or Airbnbs or similar. Um, you know, those accounts, especially with like hotel rewards and things like that are valuable to hackers, right? So like somebody's able to get into your account and steal your points, like they can sell that uh, outside. So that that is oftentimes a valuable resource. So just be extra wary of cybersecurity attacks or phishing attacks, account takeover attempts on your uh, hotel accounts uh, in particular, because those can be, um, those can be stolen. It's also able to, you're also able to transfer your tickets a lot of times. So those of you using like the ticketing platforms to get those tickets, be extra vigilant around that, not just around phishing attacks, but also scams. Yeah, that, that is definitely in, uh, in our final, that, that kind of just also goes to the final note. Like I think before you click, like we have to be cognizant. Uh, you just have to be aware. Um, I would say in, in, in efforts of our live stream, and I doubt the Los Angeles Olympic committee here in California is watching our, our LinkedIn live or our YouTube. Uh, but give us a call because you should have pass keys deployed. And if you need to work on it now, you got four years. Just let, just let us know because no MFA, password only. Th this is not where we need to be in twenty for the 2028 Olympics. Um, so we're here for you. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have any other information. I don't know if you have any more stuff you want to add. I, um, I do hope that we all get to enjoy the Olympics um, and see everybody see everybody uh you know every country and their participation obviously go usa for this um there are specific sports uh that i'll be more of a fan of i think you and i just kind of described some boxing um track is always really good and of course you know since the days of michael phelps we all kind of start paying attention to swimming a little bit more um so the hope everybody enjoys the olympics and uh for you Paris individuals who are on the cybersecurity staff and the IT staff, my hat's off to you guys. Good luck. Yeah. And by the way, the mascot is a hat. I just Googled <laughs> it. So hats off to those guys. <laughs> and that worked out perfect. I had no idea. Um, ho hopefully uh, you get to have a wonderful Friday afternoon. Uh, I know it's getting ready for the weekend to start for you, sir. Uh, and I'll be looking forward to the next time we get to be together uh, there over there in New York. Me too, man. Enjoy your weekend. All right, guys. Thank you, everybody, for uh, whoever participated and enjoyed our LinkedIn Live. Anybody who's on YouTube, great. Uh, and hope to see you guys next time. Uh, and if there's any topics or ideas, please let us know. We would love to cover them.